Shabbat Shalom, Cornerstone. Shall we stand and begin our service? worship team oh man thank you so much for coming you may be seated isn't it a delightful day the big yellow thing has come out we're having some warm weather I haven't been hit once by a raindrop have you it is absolutely delightful well have you had a good week yes have you come today expecting to be touched by the Heavenly Father what did he say when two or three are gathered together he is yes. here we should come expecting it was interesting in John, I'm reading that Yeshua actually healed on the Sabbath. So it must be okay that we pray to him and expect that the Heavenly Father would touch us for his arm is never too short. Do you need a special touch from the Heavenly Father today? Do you need a healing in your heart, in your life, in a relationship? 
I want you to take the opportunity to trust in him that he can do something for you today. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, let's start and stand, and we're going to sing the Shema. That's going to get us in the swing of things. Clear your throats. Are you ready? Breathe deep. Get those vocal cords ready. Here we go. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Baruch Shem Blessed is the name of his esteemed kingdom for all eternity. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for bringing us into your presence. To bring us together on your set-apart Shabbat, Heavenly Father. As we are brothers and sisters that come together in an assembly to put the things of the world aside and to focus our hearts, our minds, and our songs upon you. Thank you for the miracles you'll provide. Thank you for your protection, and thank you for your provision. Yahushua Mashiach's name we pray. We all said amen. Let's have some gentlemen come and hold the tallit, and we're going to bless our children. You know, it would have been nice back in our day if we would have been blessed. Wouldn't that be something? This is such an opportunity. It's just awesome. Make sure to get all the children packed in there. Yes, here we go. And let's hold our hands to the children while we sing. May Yahweh protect and defend you. give the Heavenly Father a hand. Isn't it beautiful? Thank you so much. Let's remain standing as we worship and praise.
Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. the book of Thessalonians say to us one of Paul's letters it says that we are to encourage one another with a particular message with a particular thought and what is that that Yeshua came once and he left for a season but he is coming back again amen at the father's command he's going to be coming back and we are to encourage one another with those words
to Jerusalem. Yeshua's name means Yahweh's salvation. So we're singing that. It's a play on words. All the world will see Yeshua. All the world will see salvation. Amen. Amen. belongs to our God who sits on the throne forever and ever and to the Lamb who was slain be glory and power forever and ever Lost. 
Praise Him today. Thank you for your wonderful plan of salvation, O oh Father. Thank you. Thank you for all of your goodness. Thank you for your mercies, which are new every morning. Amen. Praise you, Yahweh.
Father, I just thank you that that's true, that the things that you did for us were so amazing, our salvation, our healing, our life. I just praise you and thank you for this in the name of Yeshua. We go into our prayer time today. I'm going to break into groups again for, for a time, but there's a couple people sitting in the back back there, one of them being Terry and the other one being Dee. I would like a group to get around them and anoint them with oil and pray for them, if you will. So let's go ahead and break up a group. If you want to be anointed, please come forward and we'll anoint you here as well.
Father, let us be a people that you want us to be. Heavenly Father, I pray that the places where we work will not define us. I pray that the homes that we own, the cars we drive, and the money that we make does not define us, Heavenly Father. We repent where we have become aliens to you, Heavenly Father, because of our sin and our pride. Take those from us, Heavenly Father. Let us be bold in our stand for you. Let the world know that we represent you to make your name renowned, Heavenly Father. Let the speech that comes forth from our mouths, Heavenly Father, be pleasing to you to be uplifting and building. And let us have the faith that we need to touch the hearts and lives of other people so that miracles can flow through us. Let us be a vessel that can be used of you, Heavenly Father. I pray for a revival, a spiritual revolution for our assembly, Heavenly Father, not only corporately but individually, so that we may be changed in a twinkling of an eye to that new creature that you had in mind all along for us that we may stand tall and united in love in one mind and one heart so that our witness to our brothers and sisters outside of this building and to our communities be effective, Heavenly Father, that miracles can flow through us, that words of living water will come forth from us, Heavenly Father. Let us be that people. Let your miracle-working power flow through us. Let us be definitive in our prayers let us our prayers be of purpose not of things memorized but a focused prayer so we want the heavenly father your spirit to breathe upon us and to minister to others heavenly father for we know it's not about us it's about you and your creation let us be those people heavenly father teach us and show us where we need to change so that we can become those people Breathe upon us, Heavenly Father. Let the revival, the revolution for our spirits start even now. In Yahushua's mighty name I pray. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to um, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We're going to take a look at uh, verses 12 through 17. Verses 12 through 17. And for the booth, that's part 2. Okay. So then, brothers, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. All those led by, by Yahweh's Spirit are Yahweh's sons. For you, you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are, we are Yahweh's children, and if children, also heirs, heirs of of, of Elohim and, and co-heirs with Messiah, seeing that we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this time and I ask that, that uh, you just give us uh, your mind to, to work with, that you just uh, use us to, in a way that shows us exactly what's going on and how this applies to us. In the name of Yeshua, amen. Romans chapter 7 and 8 are kind of really interesting books for me. And I, so I, I, as we go into this particular uh, part of chapter 8, I want to just make some, uh, maybe define a couple things. Because one of the things he's talking about is the flesh. And so we need to kind of define what he means by the flesh. Does he just mean the skin that we have now? Or is he talking about something deeper? And really he is talking about the flesh, but he's also talking about something deeper. Um, the, the word actually in the Greek is used for flesh. It, it, it means skin meat or skin wrapped over the bones, if you will. But he's also talking about that something that we really uh, need to discuss. He's talking about our old sinful nature. Okay? So we can see exactly what he's talking about if we go back to Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 13. 
It says, therefore, therefore, did what, what is good caused by death? Absolutely not. On the contrary, sin, uh, in, in order to be recognized as sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that through the command, commandment, sin might become sinful beyond measure. For, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am made out of flesh, sold into sin's power. For I do not understand what I am doing, because I do not practice what I, what I want to do, but I do what I hate. And if, if I do what, what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it, it is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the, the good uh, that, I, that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not, do not want to do. Now, if I do what I do not want, to want, I am no longer the one who doing it, but it is the sin that lives in me. So I discover uh, a princip- this principle. When I want to do what is good, evil is with, with, with me. For in my inner self, I joyfully agree with Yahweh's law. But I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am. Who, who will rescue me from this dying body? I thank Yahweh through Yeshua Messiah, our master. So then, with my mind, I myself am, am a slave to the law of, of Yahweh, but it, with my flesh to the law of sin. Okay, in this passage, Paul's talking about this law and, that we've been discussing and so forth and being used to show us our sin. Now, in, my, in, 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 this, in what I just read here, I want to, to go back over something really um, and, and see it, that it says, in order to, to be recognized as sin, it was producing death in, in me through what is good, so that through the commandment, sin might become sinful beyond measure. Oh, the question there. How bad do we think our sin is? Let's talk about America today. Especially today. We can see it really clear today that obviously we are redefining what sin is and what's good almost on a daily basis nowadays okay to the point where where we don't really think there is sin anymore look around look at the things in fact those that believe in sin are are being cast out as being closed-minded and they don't know what they're talking about and only those that are open-minded to these things are the ones that are in the know, right? And so here we are, and we're, we're, we're talking about sin that, that, is, that this law is supposed to have revealed to us that should have made us sick to our stomachs. Does it? That's a question we have to answer because, you know, the truth is if we're, not, if we're not looking at sin that way, then we're not looking at the right way at sin. And maybe we're taking too lightly what's taken place and what it's done to us. Because the sin that he's talking about that should make us utterly sick to our stomachs is the sin that's killing us. And that's what he begins to talk about. He begins to talk about that, that this sin nature that is within him is fighting against the Spirit. Now, I want you to know something. He calls this, this law spiritual. We know the law is spiritual. Okay, now let's think about this. When we are, are, is he talking about the law that was stamped into to the, the, the Ten Commandments into the stones? Or is he talking about a law that was to be placed within us? There's a difference. The reason they got those stone tablets is because it revealed their stone hearts. 
And that was supposed to show them what their hearts were like. Even Ezekiel talks about that the stone has to be removed from our heart. So we have this war that is waging within us. A war against the old sin nature that is against the spirit of the law. I got I got to tell you something. That war is alive and well today in each of us. And so we have to somehow start to define just exactly what it is. I don't know about you, but I, know, I don't want to just read something and have some kind of mental assent to something. I want to know how to apply it, how to make it work, how to, how to live it out in our, in our lives. And it really is going to come down to uh, a relationship, if you will, that, that Paul is beginning to talk about. He's been talking about all along about this, this receiving the Ruach that gives us life. So what does that mean? How does that play out in our life? Turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. Let's take a look at uh, verses 21 through 31. It says, tell me, those of you who want to be under the law, don't you hear the law? For it was written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave and the other by a free woman. But the one by the slave was born according to the impulse of the flesh, while the other, by, the other one by the free woman was born as a result of the promise. These things are illustrations for the woman present, uh, for the woman, the woman present, the two covenants. They represent the two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai and bears children into slavery. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai and, in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children. But Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother, for it is written, rejoice childless woman who, who, does, who does not give birth. Burst into song and shout, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate are many, more numerous than, than of the woman who has, has a husband. Now, now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as, as the, this child was born according to the flesh, per, persecuted the, the, born, the one born according to the spirit, so also now. But what does, what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her son, for, for the son of the slave will never be a co-heir with the son of the free woman. Therefore, brothers, we are children of, uh, not, of, not of the slave, but of the free woman. There was a promise. Now, here's what, he, here's what he, he's saying. is through this promise, one that cannot be done with hands, human hands, okay, is something that we need to know about because he says that that's who we are if we receive Messiah and his, and his Ruach. We're children of promise. What did he promise Abraham? He promised him not only the covenant, but he also promised him a, a descendants that were more nu numerous than the stars in the sky, right? In which we're part of. And therefore, what does that mean? In, in we look at these things, there were, whole, there were different things that needed to take place. Let's go to, back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis 22. 
I want to take a look, try to take a look at really um, what it looks like and, and what we're doing, okay, and how to, how to do these things. After these things, Yahweh tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of, of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. So Abraham got up early in the morning and saddled the donkey and took him with his two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for burnt offering and, and set out to go to the place Yahweh had told him about. On the third day, Abram looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abram said to his, his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will, will go over there to worship. Then we'll be back to you. Abram took the wood for the burnt offering and, and laid it on his son, on his son Isaac. In his, in his hand, he took the fire and the sacrificial knife, and two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and said, My father, and he replied, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the, for the burnt offering? Abram answered, Yahweh himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. When, when they arrived at the place that, that Yahweh had told them, him about, Abram built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife and to slaughter his son. But the angel of, 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 the, of Yahweh called to him from heaven and said, Abram, Abraham, Abraham. He replied, here I am. Then he said, do not lay a hand on your, on your boy or do anything to him. For now I know you, are, you fear Yahweh since you have, have not withheld your, your only son to me, to me. This is about relationship. What he's talking about is a relationship with Yahweh. What Abraham did from the beginning was to believe Yahweh. And we can see that he believed Yahweh because he lined up with what Yahweh told him to do. He, he said, to go sacrifice your son. And you notice there was nothing more from Abraham other than he got up in the morning and got his son and the wood and the knife ready and, and took off. What he's doing, what Yahweh is doing in our lives, he's trying to get us to line up with him. But it takes us that we need to believe him. Now let me ask you, let me ask you this, it, it, it just passing here. If Yahweh said, go sacrifice your son, your one you love, the only son that was given to you, what would your response be? You see, when he tells us these things, what he wants to do is to have us line up with what he tells us by believing him. That's the whole idea. This is about a relationship with Yahweh. You know what? We get so involved in, in the, these little individual sins and so forth, when in reality what we should be involved with is how to get this relationship with Yahweh correct. Because even in 1 John chapter 1, it says that Yahweh is light, and there is no darkness with him, within him. And it says if we walk in the light with him, then we can have fellowship with one another. It's about relationships. It's about me believing or you believing in Yahweh to where we're, we're, we're so much in love with him, we're so much in, in faith in him that we line up with whatever he says to do. Amen? Amen? If he says, get up and go pray for that person, get up and go pray. Because he means for you to pray for that person, and he means to do something in that person's life or in your life. Are we children of the, of, of the promise just because, just because we... Uh, 
we believe that, that Yeshua is the Son of God? Or are we children of promise because we believe what he said? And we're lining up with what he said. See, our, the application of this is when I hear him, according to his word, I need to line up with what he says. That's what the whole thing has been about. You're right. That's what the Shema is about. Hearing and obeying. You know what? We talked about this in Torah today too. That means if there's affliction in my life, if there's persecution in my life, and I pray and it doesn't go away, then I need to thank him for that because you know what? He's putting it in our lives for a reason. And if you listen to what Paul says, it wasn't removed from his life because Yahweh wanted to keep him humble. Did you get that? If there's persecution in your life and you prayed to have it removed, it may not go away because Yahweh knows that it needs to be there. For a reason. Recently, can I tell you a story about myself? When I was young, I was about eight years old, I guess, my mother left my dad. And I've told some of you about this. My mother had left my dad. And took my younger brother who was at school with me and took off and didn't say that I didn't even know she'd been there. I, got, I, I found out she had left when I got home. And um, my dad was there <clears throat> and explained to me that she'd left and she'd left me too. Uh, there, was, there was no reason for it. I, I was never really given a reason until years later. Uh, so I had this huge hole in my life that the name of that hole was rejection. Okay? I never thought that I'm good enough for anything. I, 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 I would date women that would, have, would be similar to my mother, and I would try to, to prove myself to them. And when it didn't go well, I would take off. I thought, I thought that I, I, I thought that I was well, thought I was over it. And Yahweh was talking to me this week, and he says, why are you rejecting me? And I said, I'm not rejecting you. He said, yes, you are. He says, every time you run into trouble, you want to quit at the thing I've called you to do. He says, you're rejecting me. You're rejecting my call. He says, yet I've never rejected you. He said, what you're doing is you're putting what people say over what I say. (laughs) That hurt. That hurt so bad. Because I, I was doing the same thing to him. And you know why, you know why it was that way? Because I, that, that hurt me so bad when my mother left me that I never wanted to feel that pain again. And I'd made a conscious decision verbally that I would never do that again. I made a contract. I made a covenant that I cannot keep. 
And, you know, as I look back, as, as, as I was talking with Yahweh, as I look back, every time there was a, an enemy to face or a trouble to face, I wanted to quit. Because I didn't want the pain. But what it shows is that there was a fundamental error in, in my thinking about my relationship with Yahweh and who Yahweh was and is. And that, that error is this. I needed to be able to believe in someone in which I, I, I allowed the enemy to, to take, rob me from that faith to believe in him. I allowed that. And so what it did was, was it, it's not that he hasn't been faithful. I'm not saying that. But what it did was I had to come to a place in my life where I have to constantly where I say, no, I'm going to believe you, Yahweh, because you never have forsaken me. You never have rejected me. And I'm going to have to, to understand that there's things that, what, those things in our lives that are brought in that are hard, maybe uh, Yahweh allowed them to be there because he wants to root out the injuries and the, and the pain and the hurt that's taking place in our life that, that mess up a relationship with him. I had no idea. I, th- I had stuffed it, I guess, down so far that I thought it was over with. When in reality, he's not going to let me stay there. We talked about in Torah that, that they were at Mount Hora, but he said that you need to stop. It's time to go. He chooses when, when we can st- go now. Because he knows that the lesson's not over with. There's enemies to face still. And I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about the enemy. There's enemies to face. And the only way that we we can learn a deeper trust in Yahweh is to face those enemies and allow him to defeat them for us. You know what, I had, I, had, I had already signed out my social security pay. I was ready to go. My wife came alongside me, and, and, and another brother came alongside me, and two other brothers came alongside me and said, don't do it. It's not the right thing to do. They didn't have any reasons. That came later, and it came at my quiet time with him. is that you cannot run from the enemy and you shouldn't because he's already given us victory. You see, how many, how many victories have we not experienced that he's given us because we don't want to face our enemy? Can you imagine? It goes back to David. David, a child went to face Goliath, the giant. And he told him that he was coming to take him out in the name of Yahweh. Goliath laughed. Israel was too too scared to laugh. And yet Yahweh guided that stone to the forehead of that giant. You see, it's it's our trust in him, and it's because we trust him, because we we have faith in him, because we believe him, that's when we can face our enemy. Because we know that if we align with him, and if we do exactly what he tells us to do, that he will defeat the enemy for us. He's our victor. Victor. He's coming back. It's like the song said, he's coming back as a victorious king, as Messiah. But we're in the wilderness. We're in that place where Israel was, where where Yahweh over and over and over again tried to get them to, he, he took care of them, he did all this stuff for them, and he tried to get them to trust him 
and they refer, refused. So up, back out in the desert they went, right? I'm coming to a place now where I don't like the desert. I don't care whether it's a resting place or not. I don't like the desert because I know that there's still a, a, a battle out there that I, I haven't faced. And that's true for each one of you. But I know now, I'm learning now. Am I perfect now? No. Because I still have to face those enemies in the name of Yahweh. But you know what? It shook me to the core to realize that what I was trying to do was run away from the enemy rather than face him in the name of Yahweh. Could, I don't know how many of you are in the same place that I am or have ever been in the same place that I am. I know some of you have. But I'm thinking, wow, I wish that I would have known that earlier. But you know what? Yahweh's got a time that he'll work out in us. You know why? Because he loves us. You know why? Because he's patient with us. He's long-suffering with us. And he's gentle. At least that's what it says according to the Spirit. And that's what I'm experiencing. How many of you are going through struggles right now? How many of you like it? <laughs> Wanted to get that one in there to see if everybody was in the same place with me, you know. <laughs> it's not fun, is it? But, I, you know, what would it be like if we just faced it knowing that Yahweh was going to take care of it? What's that? The cycle would be broken. You wouldn't keep doing it over and over because you keep facing it. Help you get to the solution so you can move on out of the desert or out of the desert. Now, we, I think we have some more time in the wilderness <laughs> before he's going to move us out. But the point is, can you run the microphone? There's people that... The point is, is that we need to, we need to show our faith. You, you see what I mean? Lining up with him when he tells us what to do actually shows that we believe, right? Because it says, it, it says clear back in, um, in uh, uh, Genesis 15, Abraham believed Yah Yahweh and he credited him as righteousness. But then, then when we get up here to where he sacrifices, the, the angel of the Lord came uh, from the heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he replied, here I am. It says, then he said, do not, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that, that you fear Yahweh, since you, ha you have not withheld your only son from me. You see what I mean? There was a test there. Yahweh was going to allow that, that his, his belief or his, his faith to be tested. And I, I find it amazing that, that Abraham just got up and prepared his son and took off to go do that, to demonstrate that. And that's what he wants us to do. Because you know what? He wants us to, to, to know him so well that we know how he's going to act in any given situation. Where that trust and that relationship is so deep and so strong that he wants, he wants us to know how he responds to that. All right, when you're struggling, I'd like to give you a few verses that I use. It's Proverbs chapter 2. 
My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thy ear unto wisdom, apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, lift it up thy voice for understanding. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shall thou under then shall thou understand the fear of Yahuwah and find the knowledge of Elohim. For Yahuwah giveth wisdom out of his mouth, knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous, a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the path of judgment and preserves the way of his saints. Thou shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, every good path. When wisdom entereth into thy heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from the way of the evil, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the path of uh, uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil, delight in the forwardness of the wicked, who weighs crooked and they forward in their path to deliver thee from the strange woman from the stranger flattereth with her words which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her Elohim for her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead none that go unto her return again neither take thy hold of the path of life that thou mayest walk in the way of good and keep the path of the righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. Turn with me to uh, <clears throat> second, uh, First Corinthians chapter 2. Here's the deal, okay, is that, that Paul is talking about the Ruach that which is in us. And, it, and it, it, the other part of the application that I want to bring clear here is uh, as part of here. We can know exactly his voice. Now, there's, there's going to be two voices that you're going to listen to or that you're going to hear, right? But this is the one that you want. Uh, verses 15 and 16. It says, The spiritual person, however, can evaluate er everything, yet himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. For who has known the mind of... Uh, uh, Yahweh's or the master's mind that he may be instructed by him but we have the mind of Messiah then I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 starting in verse 3 For, for, for though we live in the body, we do not wage war in an unspiritual way. Since the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but we are, they are powerful through Yahweh for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish every argument and every high-minded thing that is raised up against the knowledge of Yahweh, taking every thought captive to obey Messiah. And we are ready to punish any disobedience once your obedience has been confirmed. You know what he's saying there? He's saying that, I, and it was, it, it was within me. I was listening to two voices. I was listening to a voice that, that caused pain at one time when I should have been taking that thought captive to Messiah, Messiah who says that he's my victor. Amen? Um, what you experienced and what we all experience in your past is what we all know is baggage. We're bringing baggage to our relationship with Yahweh. And it happens on a regular basis. You know, we just have to turn it over to him, confess that, and uh, let him be our focus in how that works out. And I, that's, that's what I believe is that when we're taking that baggage and giving it to him to do with as he pleases, you know, sometimes the pain and the struggles and the consequences and so forth that come from that are truly necessary. Other times, it's, it's not going to stand. It's not going to be our, our mode of life. It's not going to 
It's not going to be uh, a forever thing. But we need to turn that all over to him because it's not about us. It's about him. And we bring it and we make it all about ourselves, even though we commiserate with each other, empathize with each other, understand that our tears and our sufferings and our sorrows, and he holds those tears in a little bottle. All of that is true because he loves us so much. But ultimately, as much as he cares for us, it's not about us. It's about him. Well, you know, uh, actually, there was twofold. There was another thing that happened at that time, too, when I was a child that was told to me that should have probably not been told to me. Um, there's a reason that Scripture says that we pray according to the will of Yahweh. Okay, I was told that if you, you pray hard enough, that she would come home. So, having been told that, then Yahweh must be against me too. You see what I mean? And so as you put all that together, all that was, was the thoughts that we are to take captive to the obedience of Messiah. You see what I mean? And so we have to be careful. This is one of the things I was talking about, about speaking life over each other. Speaking life over each other, speaking that which builds up, is speaking his word and the truth over each other. By saying, listen, that's not thinking correctly. And saying, here's what Yahweh says about you. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that, that, that uh, he says he'll, he'll never forsake you nor leave you. That's the truth. And that what he does, he brings, he allows these things to come into your life that, get, that begin to expose the strongholds in our thinking, in what we believe. And he wants to teach us how to tear down those strongholds and bring them captive to the obedience of Messiah. When we do that, okay, back to, back to Romans, when we do that, we begin to put, to, put away or, or we begin to, to kill the deeds of the flesh because we begin to walk according to the truth. Amen? I'm not sure, that's, that's kind of a long answer, but um, the, one of the things is to recognize, uh, you know, in, in whatever it is, to recognize that we do have these strongholds, okay, and identify them, and begin to, to bring in scripture to say, no, this is not the truth, but the scripture is the truth about what he thinks about me, okay, because ultimately, Brad said it, ultimately, Everything else doesn't really matter except for our relationship with him. You see what I mean? Because, and it's almost like I'm saying, oh, well, there is, there is no law. That's not what I'm saying. Because if we go into a deeper relationship with him, he begins to write the laws upon our hearts so that we can live. Just because it's written on stone somewhere doesn't mean that I can do it. It's by the power of the Ruach that I can do them. You see what I mean? And as I begin to learn how to be obedient to, the, to what he's saying, as Abraham did, and face those things, and face those things with truth, and begin to pull down those strongholds, that's when I have the power to do it in the spirit, in the Ruach. And that's what Paul says. Is it because... That's our only power. This flesh will never have anything good. In it. That's what he says too. This flesh will never have anything that's good. And that's, why the, that's why in the end he changes us from this flesh 
to a new glorified body with him. One that's done away with all this stuff, that where we don't have to eat those strongholds anymore. The practical application is to, 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 list, to hear what voice you're listening to and take it against Scripture and call it a lie and say, this is what he says. I guess what I'm really sensing out of this is no matter what our the physical signs of any argument or any attack that we have going on in our lives or whatever we're struggling with, it's all based out of the spirit and really the way to fit, to have that, it, it's all a spiritual battle. And the only way that I can see to combat that is Ephesians 6, putting on the armor of God, each piece with prayer. But then it, right at the end of that, it's, it, with each piece, it says, stand firm. It doesn't say for us to go out on our own and attack, the, but to stand firm and let God do the fighting for that, us. That particular passage is kind of interesting because it's, I, I studied it when I was in seminary, and it actually means not only to stand firm, but it actually means in, in the picture, kind of a picture part of it, it means that there's this this massive rolling battle that's headed your way and when it gets on the other side of you you're still standing that it didn't knock you over it didn't it didn't hurt you okay so that's exactly what they're trying to say in this whole thing and we can only do it as we do this as we begin to take those thoughts captive and, and replace them the, the lies with the truth you see that we're all walking around with these lies that the enemy has put there. It goes back to my relationship with Yahweh. What does Yahweh say about me? Because what Yahweh says about me and what I can do is what I can do. But you know what? The lies will never bring me to the place that I can do anything that he's called me to do. In fact, most of the time, the way I was thinking most of the time, I, I wasn't really sure whether he was going to answer a prayer or not. Right? And the worst part is, is I stuffed it so long that I thought I was done. I'm glad, for, I'm really glad for my, my times in the morning with him. I'm so tickled about that time especially times like this where he says this is what's going on this is what I want you to do I came down excited ask Sharon I came down excited See, wait a minute you got to hear what he said <laughs> because you know it was powerful go ahead you needed that experience that's why it hurts yeah. You needed, <clears throat> in order to have that solved, you needed to go through that. And now look how happy you are, that you're just beginning to learn that. I mean, that we're just people living by the Spirit and just actively engaging in the process of sanctification. Well, That's he, the only way we can put to death. He used her again, too. Is that so? She made a comment a couple weeks ago uh, before this time, and... and uh, and I, I didn't say much to her at the time. I kind of walked away. But she made a comment and said, you're still the little boy that's being, that has been rejected. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, I'm not sure I like hearing that. So I, <laughs> so I wandered off, you know. But Yahweh wanted me to hear it. So. <laughs> so. Yeah, he was showing me this week, or last week, he was showing me too that um, we don't realize it. A lot of times we don't realize it. That's why I needed to go through what I went through too, and he'll show you something. I was burying my head in the sand for years as a young believer. Um, maybe relationships get hard, something comes in your life and it's hard and you know, you go to God's word and you, you, you cry, you, you do whatever and you're kind of on cloud nine 
And so you get over it. But he wanted to say all these years, and he finally was able to say, but Tricia, we had work to do. I was glad you came to me. That was the first step. Yes, come to me, but you can't stay on cloud nine. We got work to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard part. So that was a great breakthrough. Well, I was actually studying the Torah too, and I got to the part where he says they were, they were staying at, at Oreb, uh, but, but Yahweh wanted them to, to resume their journey at that point. And I thought, hmm, time to move, huh? People think that we're, that we're humans having a spiritual experience. I think we should flip it. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. I have, to, I have to go before Yahweh in repentance all the time uh, for doubting him, my doubts, constantly. And, and I always say, you, you've always given me more than enough. He don't just give me what I need. He, he always has given me more than that. And, and, and I, I don't even understand why I'm so dense that I don't get it, that I'll turn around and then doubt whether he's going to give me enough again for whatever situation it is. I, uh, my stupidity amazes m myself. I mean, I, it just, this flesh. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it's a crazy thing. Because like he said, we're, we're spiritual beings living in this flesh, not fleshly beings looking for the spirit someday. I usually don't put it that it's way. It's now. I usually don't put it that way because then I have to go down to her and say, hey, I just learned how stupid I am. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, don't quite know what I'm going to say, <laughs> but I am going to say something. Um, um, I know in my life, when I learned the biggest lie, the one I'd listened to since I was a little girl, um, I was 74 years old when I learned it, that it was a lie. And the walk out of that lie took a lot of work. Now, you're not 74, <laughs> but it's going to take a lot of work. And so I'm just hoping that before we finish today, that Dale will take the time to anoint you and let us pray for you as our pastor to cover you and to stand with you as you walk this out. Um, I think there's, you, you talked about how we have strongholds, how do you break those strongholds? I think that believing a lie is one of them. The analogy I, I thought was, in that moment when that happens, if the thing happened, whatever that thing is in your life, but the enemy comes in and gives you the lie, you're not, she left because you have no worth. You're not lovable. You know, and that little thing, you put on these glasses and look around, see? Everything you see is now tainted by that lie, that you're not worth it. And so in this breakthrough, it's taking off the glasses and being able to re-look around at your history and the, people, the way people interact with you without the lie tainting it. So don't put them on again. <laughs> no, I, and, and actually it, it went even deeper than that. There's part of it I didn't even tell you is that uh, one of the things he said was to me too is that you're carrying more of what people are saying than what I say. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that's, that's another strong or another lie that I need to, to, uh, to overcome because he wants me to believe what he says about, about me regardless of of anything else and so um, and that's an important point because I think we all tend to um, a little bit listen to what people say about us you know what I mean yeah. and care about that so. so when I was working through this the four things that were presented to me were you know are you believing a lie and how does that meet a stronghold in your life is there a sin that you're entangled in that you need to repent of is there someone that you have bound yourself to whether physically or in a contract, that you need to cut ties with because that's, that's going to keep you entangled. 
And then, and is it demonic? And is it something that the blood of Yeshua can, can conquer that immediately? But, but being willing to look at each thing, when there's that stronghold, it, it, it's powerless against Yeshua. But we're not, in our own strength and, and without admitting it, and looking at those areas and evaluating it, then, then it doesn't go away. But anyway, and the book that I went through to learn those things is called Freedom Tools. So I was just going to offer that too. But those four things have empowered me to start casting off the glasses, to reject the lie, to be able to look at people hurting me and to separate their old man from them as well. Yeah, the, the other thing too is, is that part of... Part of uh, Unfortunately, part of uh, what people are looking at what people say and, and taking it personally and not, not saying, well, that's not true because this is what he always says about me, um, is, is actually judging the other person as well. I don't want to judge other people. Um, I may judge whether there's truth spoken or there or not, but the, the, the idea that, that he showed me was the idea that, you know what? I don't want you to come to me thinking and asking me for judgment on somebody. Um, I want you to think of me as loving you and that person or persons or whatever. And I want you to, to place both of you in my hand and allow me to be the judge of both of you. Because I'm the only one that loves you uh, perfectly, you know, and that you, that you can sense the, the fear leaving because in perfect love casts all fear, of course. And so um, it goes back, and Paul brings this up in, in this passage here. He says, he says, let's not fall back into a, the slavery of fear. And uh, that's exactly what happened, is that, that I was fearful uh, because, I, I, once again, I, I bumped up against that being uh, rejection, that, that rejection. When in reality, I should not have been fearful at all because, because Yahweh had never forsaken me. You know, so, so those were the, the strongholds that he began to show me. Uh, it's been a great week, but it's been a tough one. <laughs> um, what you said about refusing to trust the Lord. Um, I hope I don't get too emotional. I will, obviously. Um, I know, uh, especially the last few years, um, sorry, the Lord clearly speaks to me, and I'll just say, you know, Lord, I'm too old, I'm too tired, I'm too broken, I, I'm losing a hope, and I, from what you said, I'm realizing in rebellion, I'm refusing to trust and obey him, and I need to repent. Which is what I did. <laughs> when I, when I, I said, you know, and I, I guess the part that hurt me the worst was I was actually rejecting him. I mean, yes. and who he is and who, what he wanted to do in my life. I guess one thing that I wanted to talk about too is the fact that when we are confronted with these strongholds and Yeshua shows us, he's shining his light into the darkness. The darkness cannot comprehend. It must leave. And, and it's his love for us that he's revealing this to us to make us better and build our relationship closer to him. So if we go at it with an understanding that he's not doing it to hurt us, but to heal us. Amen. Because a lot of times we don't want to face that because we're afraid of having to deal with all the stuff that comes with it. In, in you're talking about the, the tablets of our heart today. I just am kind of getting one thing um, based on the parable of the sower. Um, I was thinking really the truth that is planted is in that rich soil. And so... Uh, Obviously, I mean, I've been doing yard work a lot lately, and you have to prepare the soil uh, before you sow. So, I, I don't know. I just look at it as it's good. It's preparation. The, you know, the, um, the, 
I guess that I also know that there's probably other stuff that he's going to bring to, you know, to my attention um, down the road other than just this. I mean, that he's going to reveal too. Um, and, it, and he's probably giving me this one now so that I'll have a better grip on the other ones that I'll be facing. You know, so. <laughs> and of course, practically speaking, it's being in his word. And it's knowing his word and knowing the truth because it's the lamp and the light. And when we compare that truth to the lie, it, it reveals the lies. And so we confess those errors, identify them, confess them, walk in the spirit and in the truth, and make choices in line with what he has instructed. Anybody else? a second Timothy 1 7 because you were talking about living in fear um, oh yeah yeah I, he didn't actually I've been a, there today this, yeah this he week, didn't uh, give us a spirit of yeah. fear but a spirit of power love right. and a sound mind you know he wants us to be comforted and feel calm in our hearts and, and not to you know and to be anxious for nothing so if something is just you know really bothering us and feel like it's overtaking us you know we just have to give it all to him and not try to deal with the problem ourselves because it's, it's just too burdensome. So we have to cast our cares upon him because we know that he cares for us. There's an there's a aspect of this whole thing, you know, um, there's two aspects that, that I think that we struggle with um, on how to fit together, how to make the application fit together. And one of them is that, uh, that we need to let him do the things within us without you know, without getting in his way. But the other is, is what is my part in it? You see what I mean? What, what do I need to do to line up with him so that he can do the job better? Because that's even what he called Abraham to do, is Abraham had to do something in response to what Yahweh said. Okay, so he, Yahweh isn't just talking us to reveal information. He's talking to us to reveal life situations so that we can better walk in the light with him. And that's what he wants us to do. So when you look at that, what is my part? My, my part in this is to, to be able to stop and, and separate those voices and scripturally go, you know what? No, that's a lie. I need to walk this way. You see what I mean? I need to listen to this voice because this is Yahweh's voice and he's the one that's going to count. Uh, I've seen a lot of believers who just say, Oh, well, I'm just going to not do anything, and he, he'll just figure it out some way. And, and, and so there's, there was, there's two pieces to the puzzle, is that he speaks, we respond. And, um, and so the response part is, is my part, is what am I going to do in response to what he's told me. Um, so, so, yeah. Yes, uh, when you were speaking, I was wondering why tears were coming down my eyes, and I as we know, strongholds are so strong that we don't realize that they're there. And so I just was asking Yahweh, and so it come a little later, and as a, there's four of us girls, uh, and my father always wanted sons. <laughs> so uh, that was one, I didn't realize that I was talking to my sister the other day, and she said also that she didn't realize how how sovereign Yahweh is, our God, that she wouldn't have done the things she did that she didn't realize. Thank you for for speaking. Anyone else? Love you. And, and some people say we don't see healing. Uh, we, we just saw it, witness healing. We are witnessing healing all the time. Um, don't, don't say that we don't witness healing. You want, you want to see the healing that you want to see, this great flashy miracle or whatever. But I see healing 
every Shabbat. Hallelujah. Amen. Anyone else? Okay, how about some announcements? <clears throat>